Good afternoon, folks. Allow me to introduce Mr. Rob Campbell here. Rob is a, a very special uh, uh, gentleman. I met That's him about. <laughs> I met him, I think, at a couple times, even in my uh, in my days of working at the uh, in the healthcare. Uh, the last time I met him, uh, the new meeting of St. meeting him, we were both at an event. And we we're getting needles stuck in our in our foreheads. Uh, it was a, a little acupuncture moment. We looked like little Martians with antennas sticking out. But all that said to say, that's that's our humorous antidote. Uh, he's a business to business sales coach. He's a, he's a speaker. He's got 30 years of professional sales and entrepreneurship uh, under his belt, and he's uh, here to help business B2B companies and organizations to drive greater revenue into into their uh, into their uh, sales. So he runs Take Aim at B2B Sales Success. He provides coaching, consulting, strategic planning, speaking, workshops, webinars, Take Aim Academy online courses. And he's been into uh, tiny living. I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let Rob explain <laughs> that part out, okay? Uh, long before it was in or had TV shows about it. Over to you, Rob. Well, good afternoon. Nice to set the bar not too high. <laughs> um, the tiny living thing, that was just, a, it was a, Bernie sent me this form to go, and there's this thing with tell us something you don't know about yourself. It's like, okay, well, so yeah, I've been into tiny living, but not per se. Like, so there's part of the rest of the story, I'll connect on it later, but had a crucible moment in life and changed a lot of things. And what came out of that was what was going to be an experiment living small that I just fell in love with. So I, my life has been very much about smaller footprint and not the tree hugging kind of thing, but just, hey, if I got a pack of batteries, I can rip it in two and recycle one and not the other. Like I live on my own, I can be as OCD as I want and not have to drive anybody crazy. So it's been an experiment. So that's where that was what that was about. So yeah, uh, my background, I was raised in a family business. I'll uh, actually, let's just go ahead and begin. I'll start this, uh, share screen, do that, share. You guys can see that. So I was going to play a video for you to set up Take Aim, first of all, because there's a whole, you'll see a motif throughout it as far as hunting and tribes and community and that sort of thing. And, and as I was saying before the meeting, a lot of times nice, polite white people come to me and say, are you sure you're, you know, you're not going to offend somebody with that? But it really goes back to, you know, for 2 million years, man has relied on hunting for sustenance. You know, so and, and it's still man does still hunt, not necessarily for his sustenance, but in sales, it's very much about hunting. So there's this video I would have shown you that kind of links all of that together and that, you know, for eons and generations, tribes didn't have to worry about feeding the or hunting parties didn't worry about feeding the tribe because there was lots uh, buffalo, for example, in North America, like 60 million buffalo. So, but the game changed. And they could no longer keep doing things the way they used to do them. They had to reinvent. And so business today is very much the same. You know, there are very few businesses that can say, yep, everything just remains the same. And we're just going to keep on counting the money as it comes in. There may have been more of those before COVID started, but it's, it's uncommon now to see somebody who's just uh, comfortable relying on the revenue that's coming in. So you'll find the whole thing around take aim is about being proactive about going out and getting the business. So again, you know, uh, wasn't that long ago 300 years ago in the in the history of humans 300 years is not a very long time but 300 years ago life was very very different and they didn't have to worry like i said about where it was coming from so they could not adopt uh, this attitude and in business i when i took over my biggest competitor which i'll tell you about this was on my i put this on my door um and it was just meant like if this is your answer like any question that i ask you then stop and rethink the you know what your answer is going to be because that's not a good enough answer so we have to be constantly thinking about you know yeah we've done it this way but is there a better way to do it and so part of that is i show this image and and see how many people recognize it but i'll i'll cut to the chase it's the view from inside the box we are all in a box of our own creation of our own history of our own life experience we see the world the way we see the world we don't consider it a bias, but we all have our own personal biases. So for the purposes of today, I'd like you to have a different image in your mind, very focused, very targeted, and it's all around B2B sales. So I, yes, I'm a sales coach. I can coach business. I can coach life coach and executive coach and all these things, but my expertise, and I try to stay within that window, is business to business sales. And there's a reason for that. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at my uh, LinkedIn at all, you'll see what my history is. I can throw this up quickly. You know, that's kind of my experiential highlights uh, of my career, born in a family business, 
Uh, always had little side gigs going even when I was a kid like you just had always had things going and it wasn't about the money it was just when you could see how something could be done why wouldn't you do that and uh, so that ended up I ended up uh, being trained professionally in sales by some of the big guys and uh, have used that I've been, and now uh, had my own dealership and then now I teach what I've learned to others so to tell you a little bit about where Take Aim came from so you understand what it's about um, I mentioned this crucible moment or whatever in time. So 15 years ago or so, I lost the, the quick story. The Reader's Digest version is I lost four family members in just over a year, all separately and independently. And so, you know, the first couple older, you know, hey, we got to take time to smell the roses. You think all that stuff, but then life happens again. You have a company, you have employees, you have, and, and it just picks back up. But by the time this, the third and fourth, my dad and my brother, those deaths, I was asking different questions than I had been before. I was very much that A-type plowing forward, driving forward, very intense. Um, and now it was still very much the same, but it was like seize the day, we're only here so long. And so that led to buying out my biggest competitor basically. So I was the little fish. I was, uh, I'd started up um, uh, with my own dealership and was consistently growing, but, but I was a smaller shop. So I had gotten up to maybe, I think it was seven of us, myself plus six employees. And the big guys in town, they had about a 40% market share. So and I've been competing with them the whole time I'd been in the area. So uh, directly competing. They had like seven sales reps. I had me. And I was always competing with all of them in their territories. Um, but the you know, situation was the owner was in his 50s. His kids weren't coming into the business. I'm looking at my succession plan now, thinking more than just next quarter, next year, my five-year plan, big picture, long term. You know, do I want him to sell out to a, to a, to a manufacturer? Now I'm competing with a direct branch instead of. So weighing all these things out just made sense. Long story short, ended up taking that business over. Went from having, you know, six employees to having 45 employees. Um, very different scenario. So there was all the management side of it and everything as well. But at the same time, you know, I took over this team of sales reps that I mentioned that I'd been competing head to head with these people for 15 years. I was not their favorite person. And, you know, the, it's funny as the owner and I were negotiating the deal. Um, he said, you know, a couple of things, we had a nickname for you around here. <laughs> I think I can only imagine what it is. And he said, the golden throat. So that, that could be worse, I suppose, but uh, they, his sales reps always would come back with stories for why they lost to me. Like I was weaving some tale, uh, I was singing a siren song or cheating, undercutting. They always had stories as far as why I was winning they never really got why I was winning. So I need, I couldn't come in there and go, ha ha ha, I was beating you. Now you got to listen to me and do it my way. I needed to bring them, bring us all onto the same page. And, and that you will see is what take game is really about first. It's not so much sales training as we'll see, but it was about how do I bring this team together, singing from the same hymn book, working on our common goal called success. Right. So I needed to, I, I knew what I'd been doing, many of the things that I'd been doing differently, why I was beating them. But now I had to figure out a way to teach it to them without it being like, do it this way. So there's a guy named Neil Rackham wrote a book called Spin Selling like 25 years ago. It was all when, solution, when we first started hearing about solution sales. Spin selling was a process for solution sales. But Neil Rackham had a quote that says, a good sales process can help ordinary mortals perform like rock stars. So I knew I needed to break it down into bite-sized chunks at least. Like I couldn't just ramble on, but I knew it had come down to relationships. What I was doing was I was building relationships and better relationships than they were. I was building better relationships with their customers than they were. So when the time came, it was a natural thing for their customer to come to me. So I had to find a way to teach them all of this. And that's where I started breaking it down into these steps and take aim when it was originally done it was literally on a, on, a, on a whiteboard on our in our boardroom going guys this is how we're going to do this and it wasn't just a sales plan it was for the whole company because you know has anybody here ever worked in a restaurant when you're younger yeah so ever have somebody you worked with like a, we owned a restaurant growing up in a family business it was a restaurant and i can remember being a teenager and seeing you know a bus would roll in and the driver would get it and you know he's coming in to talk to the my dad or the bosses at the front saying, can you guys accommodate a busload? And you'd see waitresses roll their eyes and go, oh, like, 
so much work and they'd be complaining about this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, what are your tips going to be? And this is good. This is good for us. This is job security. I always saw the world that way, but there was always people who saw it differently. So, you know, in a company of 50 people now, I had administrative people who very much saw customers as a pain in the ass often. You know, customer service was like crossing T's, dotting I's, getting it out the door. They were almost like government compared to how I'd operated. You know, 25 after, actually at 8.30 exactly, people would be walking in the back door. Then they'd be taking their coat off and they'd be going and making their coffee. And then they'd get to their desk at 22. And then, at, you know, 20 after 4 or 25 after 4, they're all getting their coats on. Their computers are shut down. It was like government. Whereas I'd come from our scenario was we were like family, like, you know, we didn't even pay attention to what time it was. It was stuff to do, or we're talking, we're learning, we're doing whatever. So it was a definitely a different culture taking that company over. And so I needed to make that part of this as well, where we really valued our customers. We understood that we're not in business without them. And not only we're going to, instead of waiting for people to come to us, because that had always been their style was we're the biggest in town. So of course you want to deal with us. So to get them to stop waiting for the business to come in and start going after it, I had, I took over a team of order takers and needed to turn them into a team of hunters and they didn't get really, they didn't really get that. So, you know, I needed essentially, I knew they didn't need sales training, like sales training to bring in sales training with all, these were all veterans, by the way, like in their forties and fifties, like these weren't young recruits. These people have been doing it for a long time. So imagine me coming in saying, Hey, I'm going to put you through the sales training. Yay. That would never have flown. So I needed to create something that was not sales training. That was a, a framework that we could build this team on and everybody, all the sales people who had their individual strengths and weaknesses and ways of doing things. I wasn't going to try and force round pegs into square holes or vice versa. You know, I wanted to give them a framework that we could all work with a, a hymn book that we could all sing from. So we understood we were all working the same way and it was about outbound. So that's long story short. I eventually, part of my continuing awakening, I realized, you know what, 50 employees, $10 million company, you know, director, board of directors, chamber of commerce, like all this stuff that had been so important to me before just wasn't as important anymore. You know, like the, the whole seize the day thing, it was awesome, but I kind of felt like I've done this. I've sold my business was office technology, copiers, fax machines, printers, multifunction devices, that kind of thing. So it's kind of like I felt, ah, the ship's kind of sailed. Like I'm not, in, I'm not, you know, excited about it anymore. I've done this. I've created this infrastructure. Things are going great, but I was looking for something different. So I semi-retired, sold to my partner, and um, just started off. I was given this offer I couldn't say no to, and then realized, ah, I don't want to work for anybody else. So. I was out west at this point. I'd actually done the whole, my part of my journey was I downsized everything, sold my house, sold my company. And I was like, hey, what does Rob want to do now? You know, like I hadn't asked myself that question since I was 21 years old. So part of that was this opportunity to go out west. And it's like, if not now, when? So I'm out there. And uh, when I realized, ah, this thing that I'm out here for is not really for me. And so I started seeing a coach and we started developing. I hadn't done a resume other than the one that I needed for the business plan to buy the business. So she's working on this business plan with me and she says, what's this take aim thing you keep mentioning and in, in your profile and your stuff. And I said, well, wherever I go as a VP sales, director of sales, director of business development, any of that stuff, I don't just come with all this experience and know how I actually have a system that works that comes along with me. And it's just, it works. So there's value there. So she said, have you ever thought about being a speaker? And I was like, Jesus, if I could figure out how to get paid by the word, <laughs> that's a business for me, for sure. Because I, you might have noticed already, I get a lot of them out in a hurry. So, <laughs> so I'll apologize now that my pace is going to be pretty quick <laughs> as we go through this. And also because I want to give you as much of this as I can. Like instead of taking excerpts out and then trying to sell you on take game by giving you the highlights, I want to give you as much as I can so you can turn around and actually use this in increasing the revenue coming into your business. Because there's a plan here to be able to do that. So that's where take game and a logo came from. I mentioned that it's not really sales training. There is, if you're new to sales, then yeah, there's some really good stuff in here that would be new to you. And I've had lots of people at my sessions that are writing feverishly because it's all, they've never heard this stuff before. But if you've done business development, much of what you hear today is going to be common. You'll have heard it before, but you might hear different angles on it, different anecdotes, obviously. And, but the power of it is, is being within this framework. It's not just sales skills. So in fact, when I say that it's not sales training, I believe that 
you know, as professional salespeople, we have a number of tools at our disposal. Some come naturally, some we learn along the way, uh, some we seek out. But I would consider professional training, sales training, to be one of the tools that I have at my disposal in my career as a professional salesperson. Not, it's not the tool. It is one of the tools that I use, as are my own skills and abilities, my intellect, my work ethic, personality and charisma, interpersonal mastery, business acumen. All of these things are tools that professional salespeople will have varying degrees of that they call on. So take aim is not another set of tools. Take aim is the toolbox that holds it all and organizes it all and optimizes it for success. Right, so think of what we're talking about today, not as I'm opening up the toolbox and showing you and demonstrating how all the tools are gonna work. I'm showing you the toolbox and then it's for you to organize your system as you want. So, you know, I talked to a number of, say, most entrepreneurs will say, yeah, I know some stuff about sales. And if you look at sales as their toolbox then, right? This is maybe what they have. They have a smattering of tools and for a lot of business, that's all that they would need when it comes to their sales. They just need a hammer, they need a pipe wrench, they need the basics, right? You know, for a lot of professional salespeople, this is what their tool chest actually looks like. They don't even know necessarily what they have. Their skills they've learned over the years, they've picked up techniques that they don't even realize that they're using because it all comes so naturally. And I'm sure you guys have met salespeople who they don't want to be penned, hand in. Like they, the reason they're successful and they like what they do is the freedom of not having to be constrained by systems and processes and check boxes and that sort of thing. So, you know, this is what most professional salespeople are working with when it comes to the tools that they have to work with. So, you know, when you think about this, this using this analogy of tools, you know, again, for the average business, you know, a little all in one pack might be all you need when it comes to your sales and marketing or your business development. Maybe that's all you need is just the basics. But maybe you're a bit bigger company, you need still some basics, but you need more than one of each thing and you need a bit more robust uh, set or maybe something like this. Or what about now this? So by comparison, in that first little simple uh, setup, you know, all I needed was one tape rep measure, one hammer, one multi-bit screwdriver. But depending on your business, and when you look at Take Aim as the toolbox, you know, your particular business, you might need every drill bit going. You might need torque wrenches. You don't just need a multi-bit screwdriver. You need every bit and everything possible for screwdrivers for your particular business. Whereas your neighbor, somebody else in this call is going to look at it and go, I don't need any of that stuff. So... While people have all over these years consistently said to me, why don't you just fill it full of sales training and go and compete with all the big guys? I'm like, because we don't need more sales training out there. There's good sales training programs out there. Why do I want to fill this full of tools that only some of the people need all of and most people only need bits and pieces of? So once you have the toolbox, now you get to look at the tools you already have, where do I put them and what tools do I need to add? So again, take aim is a, is a, it's, it's, it's a toolbox that adjusts in size for what you need as a company, everything from little toolbox up to the big one, right up to the, the great big thing. So, cause it even works for big corporations. It works great in scenarios where you've got a team of salespeople and you want to try and herd those cats together. Works great at that end, but as a little business end as well, like to have this framework to know exactly what to do next. Like as a little aside, I'm starting another business that will be launched next week. And because of Take Aim, like within a matter of less than a week, I've got my target list of all the different people that I'm after, not just prospects and potential customers, but synergies, referrers. Like I've got a system and a process for doing that. So when I'm ready to pull the trigger on the business, I can start making sales calls immediately and not based on demographics, but based on actual companies and organizations that I know. Again, we talk business to business, not business to consumer. So some things I hope you come away with today, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to speed up, believe it or not, even more so. So certainly throw your hands up, but I want to give you as much of this as I can. Uh, framework, structure plan, solid, manageable, measurable sales process, uh, understanding the importance of enthusiasm. We'll come back to what has to happen after we close the sale, seeing your customer base. So those are some of the things we're, you'll, you'll hear today. So before I could start putting these people on a, a relationship framework or a relationship model, I needed to make sure that we were all on level playing ground sort of thing, right? Like, 
aside from sales skills and stuff, there are some basic things that I believe every professional salesperson or entrepreneur who has to do sales should have or know. You know, if you don't already know this stuff, then you can be working on it. You'll know varying degrees of it. So I created that. It initially was called the basics. We've now called it the top 20 B2B sales essentials. So there's the list of the top 20. I'm not going to go through them all with you. I'm going to highlight a couple of them for you. Um, I can, uh, well, this will be recorded. You'll be able to go back and see this on the screen and pause it probably. So, um, but uh, for example, the first one is defining success. So I, you know, I had the team of salespeople, but every one of them had a different version of success. One guy wanted to pay his mortgage off within five years. Somebody else wanted to be able to retire. So, you know, we talk about, first of all, what is success to you? Envision it. Because how many entrepreneurs do you know who've blown by it? They didn't really know what they were after. They, they passed success a long time ago and just keep on going. Not really any finish line in sight. So we go through this exercise and there's a whole exercise involved in visualization and what does your life look like around you once you're quote unquote successful. Another one of the top um, 20 is attitude. You know, understanding attitude. So most of you recognize what that analogy stands for, right? So Obviously, we know that a pessimist sees a glass of water as half empty and an optimist sees it as half full. But the truly successful salespeople and entrepreneurs that I've known simply see a glass of water and start looking for people who are thirsty, right? So yeah, glass half full, glass half, half empty. It's important about knowing what that attitude is. I also have a whole thing. I talk about red lights and green lights and the importance of both and, and understanding what they are. But in business, Let's not get caught up in waiting until my glass is full before I go out and share it. There are thirsty people out there. I have water. Let's go. That's the attitude. Like, what are we waiting for, right? You can wait till your website's perfect. You can wait till you have a full list of customers. You can wait, 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 wait. But this program is not about waiting. It's about going and getting and having a system and a process for doing that. One of the other top tens, the only valid definition of business purpose is the creation of a satisfied customer. I've amended the quote. The quote is from Peter Drucker, who they call the father of modern management. And I've thrown the word satisfied in there because I, you know, in his day back in the, I think it was the 40s and 50s, yep, creating a customer was the goal. But we all know examples of companies who can create thousands of customers and give them all customer numbers and technically they're customers. But if they're not satisfied customers, they're not likely going to stay. So for my purposes, that definition better have the word satisfied. And I actually would add another one. I would say the creation and retention of satisfied customers because that's really what the difference is, right? So that's the, uh, the role of sales is another one of the top 20 B2B essentials, understanding the role of sales. I mean, I've known salespeople that when they introduce themselves at a networking event are looking at the floor, shuffling their feet like they're at AA. You know, saying I, I'm I'm in sales. I'm in you know, blah, 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 blah. you know, like guess what? It's the best friggin' job in the world. Get behind it and be passionate and love it. So we talk about that in the role of the role of sales, but also for the companies. And we're talking later about you know, I'm, I've known business owners that would say I I hate salespeople. I even hate my own salespeople. You know, they don't understand the role of salespeople. They think it's a necessary evil. But, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are, how effective you are, how much product exclusivity you have, how cheap you're, it doesn't matter, any of that, if nobody knows about you or remembers you when it's time to buy. That is the role of sales to make sure that you, your company, is ever on their mind, that you don't have to always be in the right place at exactly the right time. <clears throat> and take game, again, as a relationship model that helps you build the strong relationships that Yes, they are going to think about you because all along they've been saying, I'd really like to deal with this person. Great, I have an opportunity. I'm going to reach out as opposed to it just being in a file drawer somewhere hoping that they think of you when the time is right. Anybody who's done sales will re recognize this guy, right? Again, like I said, there are people out there who just do not like salespeople. Like they, you know, they are not salespeople. They would say, I could never be in sales. But again, a number of bad apples ruin it for the rest of us. You know, like it's, there are lots of tacky, obnoxious, pushy salespeople out there. And that's why you've got people who are ashamed to say I'm a salesperson because they're afraid they're going to be painted with the same brush. We're talking here about business professionals, entrepreneurs and business professionals and sales professionals that are not used car salespeople. They're not aluminum siding people. They are professional salespeople who have a great product that they're passionate about and want to uh, trade that for revenue. The Trinity of management, that's another uh, one of the top 20 essentials. This actually comes from um, that Neil Rackham again. He talks about in Spin Selling, the Trinity of management. And 
basically the theory is regardless of whether you're a business or not for profit, a uh, government agency, it doesn't matter. Every organization needs to have three main focuses, regardless of how many departments you have, regardless of how many department heads or portfolios, there are three parts of any entity. Oops. Back over here. First of all, obviously you gotta have a product or a service to start with. Like, you know, somebody better be in charge of making sure we have a good product, et cetera. Then we've got finance because it doesn't matter how good a product it is. If you don't know how to manage your money, you're gonna lose money. How many people do you know? How many businesses have you seen that turn over tons of business every month, but lose money every month because they don't know how to manage their money, carrying costs, interest charges, et cetera. So better have somebody who gets that. And last but not least is sales. And in fact, this should be reversed. It looks here almost like things are falling into sales and that's the exact opposite of what we talk about. It's not, a lot of people see, in fact, I've had MBAs tell me that, you know, what they taught us about sales in MBA school was essentially what to do after sales happens. Because an MBA is a master's in business administration. Give us money, we will administer budgets, we'll administer the company. But even MBAs are not taught to focus on sales and outbound sales. So this is, it's very important that of these three parts of the company, sales, I have another image that I often show of an arrow and looking at, at sales being the arrowhead, you know, the product being the shaft and the weight and the, and, the, and the quality of the shaft and finance being the flights on the arrow that makes everything fly true and straight to the bullseye. So, it, but it's again about not be catching sales, but going out and getting sales. Another one of the top 20 is the how sales and marketing feeds the tribe. There's three ways, fishing, farming, and hunting. Farming is cultivating existing crops, customer care, maintenance, expanding our relationships, selling them more, et cetera. Fishing is, I equate that to the advertising. That's I'm gonna throw uh, bright, shiny lures out there and I'm gonna hope that they're bright and shiny enough for the fish to bite. But I still am relying on the fish to either bite or be where I'm throwing the net at the time I'm throwing the net. This program, as you say, is about hunting. You know, we know what we're after. We know we can figure out where we're likely to find it. We know what it's going to take to bring it in. We go get it. That's hunting versus any of the other two. So that's how sales and marketing feeds the tribe. And before we can hope to make a sale, there's one thing that has to transfer from seller to buyer, and that's enthusiasm. Sales is a transfer of enthusiasm. Whether that enthusiasm is because of fear, because they, they have to have it, it's still enthusiasm. And we are in the business of transferring that enthusiasm. So, you know, I use it, uh, the actual name of the, of the essential is called infusiasm because I focus here on employers and management teams because sales, fine, sales is a transfer of enthusiasm, but sales is also the job that's going to take more hits and knocks on enthusiasm than any other. Right, being told no and, and being treated like a loud salesperson, all those things really bring down a sales rep's level of enthusiasm. So handing over a price book or a, a website and saying, you know, here's how much money you're gonna make, off you go, stay rah, rah, rah. You, they might head out the door feeling that rah, 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 but by the end of the day, it's like, oh, you get told enough, no enough times, now they're starting to not wanna go out and cold call and et cetera. So it's very, very important that organizations understand the importance of infusing that enthusiasm on a regular basis into their sales personnel. And the final essential is what's the customer really looking to buy? They're looking for peace of mind. They just wanna know that they haven't made a mistake. In business to business, you know, if there's an incumbent there already, why would they come to you if they've got peace of, they know the devil they know versus the devil they don't. We've got to make them understand that they are going to have complete peace of mind with this decision. They're never going to have to think about it again. That's really what we're selling. Those are just a sampling of the top 20 B2B essentials. Um, and we, obviously, we normally dive very deep into them and let people, we, we talk them through and we use examples and, and uh, people recognize where they've been in those situations, how they could change those, et cetera. But the program itself, take aim. So now we come to it. So take aim is target. Time is money, where are you investing it? Approach, opening the lines of communication. Connect, setting yourself apart by getting yourself within. Expand, the more you know, the more you can help. Acquire, this is putting pen to paper and creating a customer. Integrate, now this is ensuring the solid foundation to the new working relationship. And finally is maintain. The customer is now ours to lose. Those are the seven steps in this real, excuse me, relationship oriented process. So let's dive in. And I won't, I'll go as kind of as quickly as I can. We've got till what time? What time do you want to wrap up? 
five more minutes. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to scroll through the last of them then because I've given you the best of it. But so targets, first of all, under targets, I have, there's three targets we talk about, personal targets, goals, objectives, financial targets, meaning uh, quota, whatever, or I want to pay my mortgage off, and then the client and prospect targets that we're after. So focusing on client and prospect targets, we've got, first of all, our current customers, let's not take them for granted, but we've got future customers, prospects, synergies, and com competition. That's in B2B, when we start looking for what we're after, those are the four categories we focus on with uh, take aim. Current customers, these are, uh, first of all, so not only we're we not going out and getting customers yet, we're, we're making sure about those existing customers. We're going to talk more about it and maintain, but the point here is to make sure that people are putting it into their schedule, customer care, even though they're not buying right now, force yourself to put it in your schedule, et cetera. So, but that starts with your internal customers, understanding who needs what from you to do their job, right? They're your supporting cast. So don't take them for granted, understand, you know, to get things done, who are my internal customers, then my external customers, that's your existing client base, making sure again, that you're working in an appropriate type and frequency. And we talk about and maintain the C, the relationship process. It's a little process that I use. Where are they going to come from? Could be geographic, vertical, horizontal. We use, I'm a big proponent of lists, process of elimination, meaning what categories wouldn't buy from me or who's not a customer yet. And then referrals and testimonials and synergies and networking. And these are all the different places that business can come from. Obviously, we normally dive into all of them when we're doing the program and see other examples and how we do it. We create most wanted lists, top 10, top 100, top 1,000, based on a number of different factors. You'll see here white whales. You know, I always caution people. I've seen so many salespeople come into the business and they start salivating over the big accounts. They, they picture what happens when they get one of those, they land one of those big ones. And that they don't realize is that by the, all the sharks are swimming around the same whale. By the time you actually get that business, there's not a lot of flesh left on the bone anyway. So if that's your plan for success is getting big account after big account, forget it up and down the street, medium-sized businesses and, and dealing with people, that's where you're gonna have success. I'll show you this quickly. When I talked about breaking down the kind of categories that we're after, I use this as a template. We start off by what are your top 10 target groups? And that's about how do other people see your product or service? Why would they come to you? What's their perspective? I actually call that the top 10 prospectives. What is the, the different perspectives of your prospects? In this case, this was for a product that I actually took to the Dragon's Den, didn't get on the show, got taped, but didn't get on the show. But a product that actually kills mold. It's a jar, you take the lid off the jar, you put it in a room, it'll kill mold in the room. But you've probably never heard of it. These guys needed marketing, that's why I took it to the Dragon's Den. But this product from a B2B perspective, we looked at commercial institutional service. So these are the different perspectives that people might want to buy or have this product. So then we take each one of those across here and we start looking at the actual yellow page categories, basically, or directory categories that would have that perspective. And we make those lists because now we can get lists of all of the service. Oops, sorry. I had to click on the actual, you know, we can get a list of all the service clubs, all the dive stores, all the hydroponic shops. Like we can get lists that have the actual name of the company, their address, their phone number, maybe an email address, their web address. And, in, and today in B2B, like we can do our homework before we ever approach, which again, this is all targeting. We haven't picked up the phone, made a phone call or sent an email or anything yet. This is just targeting. So synergies, this is your networking, trade organizations, networking groups. We're all very familiar with them for sure. There's a technique called working, well, talk to the tribe. When I talk about working the room, I've developed a technique called talking to the tribe. So if you go to the website, you'll have an opportunity on my website at takeaimatsuccess.com. You can subscribe and then you'll get talking to the tribe, which is a 30 minute video or so for free. So it is around physical events. It talks about physical events, but the techniques and the personas apply either way. So that's free if you want that and understanding how to do elevator infomercials, et cetera get involved. So competition, again, just understanding who they are, who are they, what are their wares, understanding what your advantages and your disadvantages are. And if you don't think you have any disadvantages, ask your competitor. So think like your competitor and really hold yourself to account where if you were selling against yourself, what holes could you pick in your, in your, in your sales pitch or whatever, but then having a story to fill that hole, right? So you control the dialogue and the narrative. If you already know what the objection is likely to be or what your competitor is likely to say, telling a story that answers that question, but in the way that you want it answered, 
just sets you up for success when they try to bring it up later, makes them look bad and reminds the customer of the good story you told them. And always remember, you never know why somebody dealt with somebody in the first place. So saying about how we're going to be so much better than your competitor or your current blah, 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 could have been his brother-in-law. They could have the circumstances. Nobody wants to be told they made a mistake dealing with who they're dealing with. <clears throat> so that is target. I can stop there because they're still approach, connect, expand, acquire, integrate, and maintain.